Hello and welcome to the MB Ohm Podcast, where you will learn to master the business of yoga with guests from around the world who have experienced becoming successful yoga teachers, studio owners, and much more. Now, here's your host, Amanda Kingsmith. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the MB Ohm Podcast. I'm Amanda, and I'll be your host for this and all episodes of the show. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Fave Yogis. Do you teach privately? Make payment and registration a breeze. Use the Fave Yogis app to create and manage classes for your personal clients. Life is just easier with autopay. You can forget about remembering to Venmo or if you're up in Canada, sending an invoice, an e-transfer or a PayPal, depending on where your clients are in the world. With Fave Yogis, you can use autopay to enable repeating payments. This will save you so much time and make things so much easier. You can also keep your calendars in sync. Google Calendar integration automatically updates teacher and student classes when you make changes. It's still just your yoga. Teachers add classes, students add teachers, Teachers and students stay connected. Head on over to the App Store and find Fave Yogis, F A V Y O G I S. Use code MBOM and let them know that I sent you. This episode is also brought to you in part by Ana Luisa. Ana Luisa is a jewelry company, and I know what you must be thinking. What on earth does jewelry have to do with yoga business? I had the same thing when they first connected with me, and then I got to know the brand, I got to know the people, and I got to know that the jewelry that they make. And I started thinking about how, as a yoga teacher, I really haven't treated myself to anything nice over the last couple of years. I've been so focused on the hustle of my business, bringing money in, that I haven't even been thinking about self-care in the form of the jewelry that I wear. One of the reasons that I really love Ana Luisa is that they make jewelry that's recycled gold. I don't know if you knew, but it actually takes 20 tons of earth mining to produce a single ring of gold. And with Ana Luisa, they use 100% recycled gold in their products. This is a huge win for me. On top of that, a lot of jewelry that we buy ends up being cheap, breakable, and it's rarely recycled. It's a huge waste for the environment. Ana Luisa's products come from the same jewelers as Tiffany's and Louis Vuitton, and they are very confident in their quality. And after trying their products, I can feel the exact same way about it. But the great thing is is that it doesn't come with the big price tag. For the first time in years, I'm treating myself to jewelry that is high quality, great for the environment, and it looks good. They have stuff that is everything from daily wear to stuff you could wear to a wedding or a big event. And for me, that's the perfect fit with jewelry. So if you have been like me and you haven't really been splurging on anything because you're hustling in your business too, but you really want to give yourself maybe a little bit of love through the form of jewelry, something that's affordable, good for the environment, and is going to last a long time, head on over to analuisa.com forward slash MBO. It's A-N-A-L-U-I-S-A dot com forward slash MBO. And they've got a little discount for you over there. And as always, thank you so much to the sponsors of this episode for supporting the show. And I hope that you guys can go support them in return. All right, now on to today's episode of the podcast. I am very, very, very excited to be joined by Veronica Tai from the Curious Monkey podcast. Veronica is a fellow Albertan, so she lives just about an hour from where I live in Calgary, Alberta, as well as a fellow podcast host. And her and I connected a while ago. I was on her podcast probably close to two years ago now, and we had an amazing conversation. And we've been in touch over the last couple of years. And then in the fall, I had the pleasure of doing some desire map coaching with her. And I was familiar with the desire map and definitely interested in it. And it came at the perfect time for me because I was able to sit down and do these sessions right before I headed into my 300 hour yoga teacher training, which was a big, a big change for me in my life and my teaching and my business in general. And it was just very, very fabulous. So at the end of that, we made a plan to not only get together in person now that I'm back in Alberta, which we were able to do last week and was really, really awesome. Uh, But we also made a plan to have her on the podcast so we could talk about all things yoga business and more specifically yoga business from a heart centered perspective. And so one of the things that I really love about Veronica and her business is that she really looks at things from the perspective of how does it make you feel and does that mean it's a good decision for you? So I won't ruin any more of it. I hope that you guys really enjoy this conversation with Veronica and I. And without further ado, here she is. Welcome to the podcast today, Veronica. I'm really excited to have you here with me. 
Hey, Amen. I'm so happy to be here with you. Yeah, I feel like this has been a long time in the making. I mean, we connected on your show and then we got to work together. You did some desire map facilitating with me, which was amazing. And now I'm so excited to have you here to be able to like pick your brain a little bit more about your journey. So yeah, really, really excited about this. And there's so much that I want to dive into today, but I want to back up a little bit. And can you tell me your yoga story, like how you first got into yoga? Yeah, totally. So I don't think my yoga story is much different from many of the other people who get into yoga. It was, what was it? It was 2006. I was in university and there was this thing called hot yoga that came into town. (laughs) And I think back then it was Bikram. And what really caught my attention back then was that this hot yoga thing burns seven to, I think it was six to 700 calories is what they claimed. And back then I was so into, and I still am so into movement, so into working out. And I absolutely loved a good challenge, especially if you can burn six to 700 calories in just one session. And back then my perception of yoga was, okay, it's this thing that you do. It's a lot more, um, it's a lot more easygoing than weights. I did my first yoga class. It was hot yoga. Totally loved it because it gave me the challenge that I liked, but there was something else that I really loved about this yoga thing. All I could really identify at the time was the vibe. And I really didn't think further than that. I wasn't pushed to think further than that by any circumstances in my life until I went on to graduate and I had my first job and hated it, had my second job and hated it. And soon enough, I started to seek this something more within myself. It wasn't necessarily the job itself that was not great. It wasn't necessarily the environment itself, but it just felt like there was this something more, something that I was meant to be doing. And I just couldn't put my finger on it. And it just kept getting louder and louder all at the same time. I didn't even make the connection. There's this thing called yoga that I did once in a while. Like I was a very, I was on and off. Like sometimes I would get a class pass and I would do it for the month and then I would drop off the boat for like six months. Then I do it again. And I did this for over 10 years until or yeah, actually over 10 years, um, until 2014. Holy moly. How, where does time <laughs> go? Oh my goodness gracious. Oh, okay. So until 2014, when I almost as of out of nowhere said, Hey, I should take my yoga teacher training. And then that's really when the lessons of yoga had come into my life. And I, realize that it was in yoga and the teachings of it, not just the asanas, not just the poses, but it is in the philosophy and the way of life that is what I was seeking. And that opened the door up finally to this burning desire within me, this thing that I had always wanted, this something more. And I would say, you know, my journey really did begin in that very first class back in 2006, but the doors completely busted open when I first stepped into my very first YTT class in 2014. That's amazing. I uh, have a similar timeline to you as well. And it's, it's kind of interesting because I was thinking, I was like, oh, I wonder why you waited like eight years to do your training. And then I was like, (laughs) I did pretty much the exact same yeah. thing. <laughs> and even when I did it, I didn't feel like I was ready. Yeah. I didn't even know what I was expecting, to be honest, Amanda. Like, I, at first I joked around about it because I kept falling into these positions that I didn't like in terms of my career and where I was spending my time most of the time. And I started joking around with friends saying, yeah, okay, whatever. If this doesn't work out, I'm just going to be a yoga teacher or something. And back then, I think what yoga teacher meant to me was like this sense of freedom because it's unconventional. It, it was, it's more conventional these days, even if, though it's only a short five years ago. But, you know, five years ago, back in 2014, it was unconventional. It was like this kind of rad, free bird lifestyle. And I think that's what it meant to me. And I would joke around about it. And then I did it. 
like one thing led to another. The teacher who was teaching at my building happened to teach at this one studio, checked out the studio, loved it. And the studio happened to have their very first yoga teacher training coming up. And so I just signed up and I don't even know what I was expecting, but it was, and this might be a bit so cliche, a bit cheesy, but like, it was like I had found home. Mm-hmm. Everything that I was taught um, in terms of the philosophy. So how yoga is the, it's to yoke. It is coming back to ourselves. It is coming back to our essential selves that everything in this life is just one big unfolding and there is no right way, quote unquote, right way, which I was really caught up with back then of doing anything. And it was, I don't, it was like, as if my world just opened up and everything that I had already thought anyways, there was a place for it. And all along, it was this thing called yoga that I already liked. I just never dug deep enough. I love that. That's amazing. I can, I can resonate with that a lot. Just like feeling like, okay, I've like found this thing that I think I'm going to do. Yeah. When you finished, did you start teaching right away or what was your like, what was your teaching journey like? Oh man, I was ready to teach. So one thing that I did know as I sat there, even before my YTT, my yoga teacher training was that, okay, so there's a something more that I'm looking for. Um, and everything that I was doing was just not quite clicking. So when that happens and you're feeling stuck and also frustrated because you're like, there's something out there for me. I just don't know where the heck it is. You start following what feels good. What at least gives you a bit of that click where it's like, okay, that's kind of the right path. And for me, it was anywhere along the lines of facilitating, teaching, or presenting. And when I took my yoga teacher training, initially, like I didn't know what to expect, but all I knew was at the end of it, then at least I could teach something, Mm -hmm. then at least I could present something. So I went in there with the intention that I would come out being a teacher. And not everyone who goes into yoga teacher training has that intention, right? And because of the training, which spanned between eight months, we would meet for three days, like a Saturday, Sunday, Monday, once a month over the span of eight months. Wow. That gave us so much time to practice, to absorb, to learn and relearn that by the time I came out of yoga teacher training, I was like, yeah, I am ready. So I was, (laughs) yeah, I was teaching right off the bat. That's awesome. And you just started teaching in studios? No, actually, I actually have never taught at a studio. I wanted to, and but that's just not where my path took me. So yoga studio to be to be um, to clarify. But where I did teach at first was a volunteer position at the YMCA. And that was such a beautiful position because everyone there was just so happy to be there. And I would teach. Um, I would teach yoga after work one day of the week. And from there, it kind of grew. I actually ended up in corporate. So I go into the offices, those same offices that I used to unbearably, unbearably sit in between those four walls. But now I go to their gyms and then I teach yoga to the corporate folks. I love that though, because it's like, I think uh, like that's the kind of audience that I really like teaching to is the people who are like, I love teaching in studios, but I really like working with people who are not in studios who don't think yoga is for them. And I feel like part of it's because I was in that for so long. Mm -hmm. It wasn't necessarily that I felt like yoga wasn't for me. It's just like I sat all day, every day in a place with like bright white lights. I stared at a screen. I felt uninspired. And not everyone who works in a corporate job feels uninspired, but that was my experience. And I was kind of like, if I can like reach these people and encourage them to move and encourage them to breathe, like Mm -hmm. that's a really beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. I love that. And exactly that, Amanda. So that's what I was saying. Like my intention, like I wanted to teach at a studio, but that's not where my journey has brought me. And I think I'm back in corporate for a reason that Mm -hmm. all that time that I wanted to teach something, present something and just uh, um, facilitate something. It 
was this message and this message of just breathe. You are enough to come back deep into the center of yourself and sit with some self inquiry because really that is the heart of the matter. And the heart of the matter is all that matters. I cannot think of a place in corporate, like an actual position that would have allowed me to do that if I had stayed in the position that I was at. So I think I had to come full circle and and come back this way. So it is beautiful to be able to come back in this way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Did you dive into like entrepreneurship right away or did you kind of like hold on to a side job for a while before you let that go? Great question. Thank you for asking. I had my job for a while. So I stayed in the position that I was at because even when I first started teaching, I wasn't totally clear on where I wanted to go with all of this. I have to say though, I'd always had this entrepreneurial spirit within me. When I was studying my business degree in back in university, I always in the back of my mind was like, okay, one day I'm going to start a business. And in my mind back then, I was like a young 20 year old. I was like, I've got so much time. Like by the time I'm like 30, I'll have a business Mm -hmm. and like all this stuff's going to happen and it's going to be so easy and so cool. So I did want to have a business in the back of my mind, but it never really quite became a reality until I started teaching yoga. I started to really re- really evaluate what I wanted in my life. And then I had more clear direction because as I kept teaching, it kept becoming more and more clear to me that this stuff, whatever box or industry, you would call it the stuff where we get to the heart of the matter, this stuff where we get to talk about the meaning of our lives, the meaning of the shared experiences that we have with each other. That's where I want to be. And once that became clear, I, it was almost like this point where I was like, I with work, I was like, I don't even have time for this right now because there's all the stuff that I need to be doing. There's this huge message that I need to be sharing. I don't even have time to be sitting here doing something that doesn't pertain to that. And then, so I leaped, I leaped in 2017 with the intention of teaching yoga and continuing with my podcast, Curious Monkey. And what has been delivered since then has been, uh, Short of a miracle, I would say. <laughs> miracle, but not really. It, it, it is. It really, really is. I'm just going to go all in and say that that's exactly what it is. When I look at my life today and what I get to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's like a blessing when you go from doing something that you don't love to being able to spend your day, like, I mean, having conversations like this. Like I always say like being a podcast host oh is like the best job in the world. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yes. To be sitting here and every single conversation is so thought provoking and every single conversation is so inspirational. And Mm -hmm. then to have meetings about more of the same thing that really lifts you up and gives you that sense of life back. Right. Totally. Yeah. And like you said before though, like I don't think everyone in corporate is miserable and is purposeless. It was just my story. I think what's more important than, oh, should you be in corporate or should you start your own business or should you teach yoga and take the leap or should you do it with a side job is tapping back into what feels right for you because there are as many iterations and combinations of how our lives can go as there are human beings on this planet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I completely agree with that. That's such an eloquent and beautiful way to say that. What was it like in the moment of like letting that side job go, like letting your job go and and being like, I'm fully in this? Like, what was that experience like for you? Yeah, it was just like the Rocky movie when he runs up the stairs. Victory! And it was so good. It was one of those things where, why didn't I just do it sooner? Some Mm -hmm. things you just know about yourself. And that comes to relationships of all kinds. Whether you're talking about friendships, 
intimate relationships or even a relationship like your job, which for me, I was there for five years with this particular company. And quite honestly, by the second year, I knew I was done. And if I'm really honest with myself, I never really wanted to be in corporate to begin with. And so when I finally decided that this is it. First, I had to trick myself a little bit because <laughs> that's how I work. I realized that um, I'm like a little piglet. I like to <laughs> <laughs> Someone once described it like a turtle. She's like, I poke my head out to take a look. And then like, I, I come back in and I poke my head out. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like, a, I'm a bit of a piglet. Like, okay, like over there, right? You want me to go over there? Okay, that's a place. Okay, let me measure that out. That's like, okay, I'd say that's like 30 steps. Okay, let's just see what one step might feel like. We'll just see. And I know that there are also people who are super bold and they just beeline right for it. It's like there, that's point B. Okay, I'm just going to gun for it. And off they go. So I kind of had to trick myself. And I was like, okay, 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 okay. So I know that I'm really unhappy in the position that I'm here right now. But how about I just do three months of being a free bird and trying to see where this yoga thing and podcast thing goes. What if I just do three months and then I can always get back into corporate? Like three months doesn't really mean anything in terms of your resume and people won't wonder too long about the gap or anything. So I had to trick myself. And, but I have to say every step leading up to that leap felt more and more and more liberating. The moment I handed in my resignation letter, I was actually really nervous because I had started in a new position and I was like, oh, I don't want to let anybody down. I feel like I have a responsibility because I was given a promotion, but I also knew I had to do what I had to do. So it was really scary and I was really nervous about letting people down up until I handed my resignation letter. And after that, it was like, a ton of bricks had been lifted off my chest, lifted off my shoulder. And as like angels were singing and I was like, I'm free. <laughs> and then the weeks leading up to, I just felt so much lighter and so much more myself. And people could actually see that in me. And they even commented on me on that about me. They're like, you're so much lighter. Like you're glowing. You're really happy. And I'm like, I guess I am. <laughs> and <laughs> finally, the day came when I woke up that very first Monday. It was April 1st, 2017. I remember it exactly. And it was like that moment of Rocky climbing up the stairs and his arms are just up in the air. And I was like, yes, yes, I made it. And it felt so liberating. It was such a high. Yeah. I love that. Was there a moment where you kind of were like, oh crap, now I need to like do some stuff to make money. Like, did that come after or were you like still like, no, I've just, I've got this. That never came, not because I was so confident, but because I had spent so many years, again, I had, um, I had always been interested in becoming an entrepreneur, right? So I would listen to all these podcasts or they were called something else before it was an actual podcast, but I used to go on websites and and try to find stories of entrepreneurs and how they got to where they were. And then finally, when the podcast scene really started up in like 2010 or, or something like that, I started to listen to Entrepreneur on Fire actually with John Lee Dumas. Mm -hmm. And he would interview for half an hour each, like people who had started these incredible businesses. And he would ask them, what was your challenge? Um, what was one of your worst moments, best moments? And I would just keep listening and sponging up these stories. So I had an idea. I was like, okay, I knew a few things, which actually ends up being really true now that I'm totally on this journey. Number one, it's all about discipline. Uh, that when your schedule is your own, it's really easy to get lost. And I was like, yeah, okay, I'm ready for that. I'm a very disciplined person. I love my schedules. I can figure this out. Although I have to say, I think they mean discipline in a totally different way. I read it as like, oh, you can't be lazy and not take action. But to be honest, anyone who starts a business to begin with, 
I think you have a certain motivation behind you, meaning that the discipline actually comes from the other side where you have to make sure that you rest and that you don't go off spending 17 or 18 hours working every single day because Mm -hmm. you will burn out. A hundred percent. Yeah. (laughs) I've experienced that much more on that side than the other side. Yeah. I totally, I still went for the whole ride to really learn it, even though I knew the lesson was right there. And I remember there was like this one point where I was kind of on the verge of burnout and I was like, oh my gosh, but this is what I love. What the heck am I doing? And then it totally clicked and I was like, oh, I see. That's what they meant by discipline. Yeah. (laughs) Make sure that you keep your life balanced. Mm -hmm. Just because you're doing what you love doesn't mean that you don't rest, right? Right. So I kind of had my eyes on that. And then I also was really attuned to the fact that you need to look at monetizing the business. That if you're not monetizing from your business, then it's a hobby. And so I was tart, like I was cognizant of all those things. But there was a point where I was like, oh shit. (laughs) And that was a whole new lesson in itself. One that I had never really heard about before in all the stories that I've listened to. So you know that Rocky moment where it's like your hands are up in the air and you're like, yes, this Mm -hmm. is it. (laughs) In my mind, that's where things stopped. (laughs) Because that's where it stops in movies, right? And they lived happily ever after and they ride off into the sunset and that's it. Little did I know back then, just short two years ago, that that was the beginning of everything. Mm -hmm. Because fast forward, I think it might be like four to six months after that, like, yes, moment. It was like I had a huge question mark over my head. And I was like, what the heck am I doing? Like when I left my job and took the leap, I had such a clear vision of where I wanted to go, who I wanted to be, and how I wanted this business to turn out. But what the heck am I doing? Because everything that I had expected hasn't quite turned out the way that I thought. And I was having a conversation with a friend and she's so brilliant. I told her what was going on. I was like, I'm so confused now. And that makes me so scared because I'm someone who always knows where the target is. I have a vision for what it's going to look like and for what I want it to look like. But now it's just fuzzy and I'm just not feeling it anymore. I'm just completely confused. And she said, well, and I was like, why don't I like that target that I had originally set my sights on? And she said, well, you've changed. So the target changes. And I was like, holy crap, that just blew my mind. And that has been one of the biggest lessons that the target moves. Yeah. And the target is not just a thing, which I still, which I still had in my mind of like, okay, and then the podcast will do this. And then my teaching hours will look like this. But the target is in how you're feeling about the messages and the work that you're putting out. Right. Yeah. That's a big one too, is like, and, and being open with the fact that things are going to change, I think can be a little bit challenging when you're kind of navigating it on your own. Like it's, it's so different when you work for somebody else and they're like, okay, like we're changing something like this marketing plan is going to be totally different. And you're like, okay, just like roll with it versus when it's yourself and you're like, okay, something's feeling like not quite right, but like, I don't really know what's going on. And then you kind of have to like reevaluate and change directions. It can be a little bit more confusing and, and challenging to navigate just kind yeah. of kind of an interesting journey. Totally, totally. And so you you've mentioned your podcast a couple of times. At what point did you start Curious Monkey? Oh, what a great question. I actually started Curious Monkey back in 2016, so I was still working. Um but that but that something more, that fire inside of like, oh my gosh, I feel like I I want to do something to help this world. I just don't totally know what it is is um, that's when I was feeling it. And that's also what gave me the motivation to start Curious Monkey. I actually had the idea when I took my yoga teacher training back in 2014, because my world was opened up to all these ideas. Like 
uh, yoga philosophy, yoga theory, this whole idea of our life unfolding, and then everything that goes along with it. It's, it's an endless world out there. It's such an interesting and super fun world in the world of spirituality and yoga. Then I started learning about past lives and chakras and sound healing. And I started getting introduced to tuning forks. And I was like, oh my gosh, I love all of this stuff. I'm so curious about all this stuff. And like, what, what is it really? Does it really work? What do you mean? Like the vibrations, the sound heals you? Like how? Like, what do you mean? Right? Mm-hmm. And so I tried to, I did what I usually do up until that point. I tried looking for a podcast to listen to that would tell me more about this stuff. And back then, all I could find when I looked up yoga podcasts were either people actually guiding you through a yoga class through the podcast, or it would be this amazing guru straight from India who would be talking mostly with like Sanskrit words sprinkled into the speech, like Blah blah. I'm I'm making all this up, but like blah blah blah, like sadna, something something, um, mulabanda, and all that stuff I didn't know before. So it was too much. I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. And that's when I started thinking, like the seed had been planted. Where I was like, Hey, maybe I should like do a podcast because I again I want to do something where I get to teach or facilitate or present. And if I'm going to be having these conversations anyway, maybe it could benefit other people to also listen to it. Maybe other people are also interested. So that's how the idea came to be. Yeah, I love that. I love like the curiosity element of it. It's uh, definitely one of the things that drew me to podcasting as well. And that just keeps me coming back for sure. Um, yeah. what's, the, what's the experience of being a podcast host been like for you? Like getting to interview people, you know, all over the place, getting to actually talk about these things that you were interested in like has it been as awesome as you imagined before you started it oh my gosh it really has been it's been even more awesome when i first started it again the target moves right even for this podcast when i first started the podcast my intention was okay and then i want to find out all this information and just talk to people who know stuff about this and that in itself was thrilling just to learn about what are some of like the crazy interesting things that I've learned about, like all sorts of energy healing. There's something called core energetics. I loved talking to therapists who ended up also becoming a yoga teacher and their perspective from the scientific end of things versus the spiritual end of things. And that in itself has been thrilling and intriguing. And that was my intention to begin with. But the gift that came with it that I didn't really even know to ask for are these stories. Mm -hmm. And one of my biggest realizations from talking with as many people as I have is that it doesn't matter who you are, your story is worthy of being heard. Mm -hmm. And your story is immensely impactful. It shows us that we're all on our own unique journeys, but nobody's ever really alone. Because no matter how you've felt in the past, no matter how you're feeling now, especially if it's a negative thing like feeling stuck or feeling like as if you'll never make it, someone else has been there and their story can really help you get through whatever it is that you might be experiencing. Hey, yogis, I just wanted to take a quick little break to talk about studio growth. Has your yoga studio's growth become stagnant? If you're like many studio owners I talk to, you've tried every marketing tactic under the sun. You started a blog, you're posting regularly on all the social media sites, running challenges, sending out newsletters, blah, blah, blah. Long story short, you're doing a ton of work and barely paying the bills. What if there was an easier way? A way to get new students regularly coming through the door without having to do so much work to get them there. A proven system that will consistently bring in 20 plus new paying students to your studio each and every month. Well, there is. Ron Medlin and his team at GetYogaStudents.com have developed a three-step system that will help you quickly grow your yoga studio 
to a six-figure profits and beyond without being shackled to your business. So if you're ready to grow fast and you'd like the blueprint to help you get started, visit getyogastudents.com today to get the exact system Ron and his team uses to help his yoga studio clients add 10, 20, or even 30 new students every single month. On top of that, you get a free 45-minute consultation session. So if you're kind of like, I'm not really too sure about all this, I don't want to fork out a bunch of money without even knowing if this is going to work, head on over to getyogastudents.com, book a free consultation, and just talk with Ron. He's got so much knowledge, and him and his team are willing to work with you with your studio's needs. And once again, it's getyogastudents.com to start getting more students in your yoga studio. This episode of the podcast is also brought to you in part by Offering Tree. Most wellness professionals struggle with creating a website and a digital presence. So Offering Tree created easy to use software that guides yoga teachers through the process in about 30 minutes. That's right. You can have a beautiful mobile responsive website in 30 minutes. Offering Tree's website tools allow teachers to put their class schedules on their own branded website and allows their students to book classes and even pay online. It also supports one-on-one appointment booking. Your Offering Tree website will have a whole host of other tools to help you be a successful teacher like newsletter and a blog, website traffic analytics, search engine optimization, client communication tools, and more. Offering Tree really does make it simple to have a website and takes care of the tech side of teaching. So if you've been putting off creating a website because you think it will be a headache, you should really give them a try. To get started on your website, go to offeringtree.com forward slash MBOM and receive 50% off your first three months. One of the things that I really loved about Offering Tree when I first signed up was how pleasantly surprised I was at really how easy it was. I've been using WordPress for years and I'm a big fan of WordPress. And I always say that once you get over that hump of understanding any type of software or technology, it becomes really easy. With Offering Tree, there is no hump to get over. It's just very, very simple. I had a website that looked really professional in less than 30 minutes. Again, check out offeringtree.com forward slash MBOM to receive 50% off your first three months and create your new website today. All right, back to the podcast episode. Yeah, I love that. That's like one of my favorite things as well. Like being able to share the stories of other people is is so magical. It's like, I, yeah, I don't know. It's just like such a great gift, I feel like. <laughs> I love it. I love it so much. And to have the opportunity to speak human to human, because I think sometimes we put each other on pedestals, right? Mm -hmm. Where it's like, oh, there's this yoga teacher who teaches, and I'm talking about you, like, um, who does a podcast that's wildly successful, who teaches these retreats, who like travels around the world. And it seems if we make it so, so unattainable. Because then I look at me and I could potentially go, but then I'm just this girl who lived in, who's living in the same city and has been for the last 10 years and hasn't really traveled. But to be able to talk human to human and learn that we all have our own struggles and this lifestyle doesn't come out of nowhere or the yoga or the yoga um, studio owner where you're like, oh my gosh, and they've got the studio and it's so awesome. And they also do this and this and this and this, and they even started a nonprofit. And then to talk to them, hear their story and get the realness out of it. And by realness, I don't mean to like look at just the struggles, but to look at everything that it took to get them there. Because it's easy for us to think that someone else is lucky or someone else just has it in them. So one day they're just a person and the next day they're a yoga studio owner and ta-da, like that's how life is. But <laughs> that's not the case at all. The, the case is there's usually something that inspires us or has been inspiring us for the better part of our lives. And that all your life, the experiences that you've been through, everything that you've learned has built you up to what you are now doing or what you're about to be doing. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that that's a really, really amazing part of being able to like talk to people about these things. Cause I've had the same thing, like getting to interview people who were like dream guests on the show or just people who I really admired that I knew in person and to hear their story 
it was like, oh, you're just like a person just like me. And like you were where I am in your career at some point. And it makes it totally attainable to be like, oh, you know, maybe teaching at a festival is totally pop- possible if that's your goal. Or, you know, hosting an international retreat is totally possible for any of us if that's something that you want. And I, I love being able to like see people on that level, like just see who they truly are as a human. Yeah, exactly. And I I do this a lot. So it's like pretty close to my heart. But you're right. We see these dream interviewees and guests that we have on and it's easy or like just dream people that we look up to that we love learning from. And it's easy to be overwhelmed to go onto their website and be like, oh my gosh, this person has online courses and retreats and their international exotic retreats. And then they teach and then they have these videos and then they have all this. And to think, especially if you're just starting off, like, well, how the heck am I ever going to get there? Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is they probably just started off teaching like a class or two. Yeah, for sure. Exactly where you are. are. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah, I think it can kind of give us that like, who am I to be doing this thing? Like the imposter syndrome. And I know I had that when I started my podcast, like I was kind of a baby yoga teacher when I started MBOM and I was like, who am I to be talking (laughs) about this stuff? Like there's so many people have been teaching way longer than me. Like who am I to do this? Yeah. And then it's like talking to these people who had these real stories and real situations and real struggles. I was like, okay, we're just, you know, we're all the same. We all go through the same stuff. Just like, it's, it's different, obviously. We walk different paths, but it's essentially like the same stuff. Oh my, do I ever have a story about that, Amanda? The who am I syndrome and especially pertaining to starting this podcast. So I had the idea planted in 2014, right? So the seed was planted and I was like, yeah, that would be so cool if I did that and maybe it can help other people and then maybe this will be my thing. And I was so inspired. I got onto WordPress, started to create a website and got a photo, like a photo shoot done with a friend and had pictures to share. I bought my mic and I started even like making a rollout plan right? because I'm such a planner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I started making a rollout plan and it was just so exciting. And then one day an overwhelming amount of fear came over me and it was this imposter syndrome. I was like, who am I? Who am I to even have this idea? Are you joking me? I'm not even done my yoga teacher trainings yet. And there are these amazing teachers out there who are already sharing and teaching. And who would ever want to waste their time to talk to me for a podcast that who, like, who am I to put together? Yeah, right. I shut everything down. I physically took my laptop, closed the lid, walked away, and I didn't tell anyone about my website. I didn't tell anyone about my plans. I just left it for an entire year. (laughs) It's like, yeah, I wanted to suffer a little more, right? So (laughs) So a year later, I was in that same place, as you would have guessed, because I didn't do anything differently. I was in that same place actually a little more miserable, which was really helpful because it gave me the motivation, a little more miserable because now a whole year has passed and <sighs> still that burning fire of there's something more. I, I want to be doing something. I want to be helping people. There's something that I'm meant to be doing. And this idea of the podcast kept getting me excited. You know, when you think of something you're like, oh my gosh, what a good idea. But the lizard brain kept coming back in. It was like, oh my gosh, what a good idea. I was like, oh yeah, remember? I already told you you were too dumb to do that. And then it shut it down. That lizard brain, seriously. It's the worst. worst. Why do we still have those? I know. (laughs) We're allowed to swear on your podcast, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. So so you've probably heard of people naming their lizard brains. I've been sharing this with some of my students. And so we've named them. Mine's is Liz after the lizard from the magic school bus. Oh, nice. Like an Ashley and a carol and it's like some days it's like Ashley's just being such a bitch right now (laughs) like yeah Liz is such a bitch right now (laughs) she's so mean but that's exactly what it was it's like yeah I already told you that you were too dumb to do this so shut it down even though the idea excited me until one day I couldn't contain it anymore um and one way or another 
I had been pointed with clarity to the direction of starting this podcast as relief. By this time, I was seeking relief for that something more to come through. And then I started it. And it's just been, again, like such a miracle and such a gift since. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you ever have a moment where you were like, why didn't I start this a year before? Yes, hugely so, especially since, and this is what I'd always been seeking, this sense of alignment, Mm -hmm. being in flow and ease and synchronicities. Like we hear this in the stories from people who are aligned. We hear this in stories where people are talking about the universe having your back. And I always wondered, well, where are my synchronicities? Why aren't my, these things happening for me? Mm-hmm. Because I wasn't, because I wasn't um, in alignment. I wasn't going the right way. I, in fact, I was going the wrong way. Then with the podcast, when I actually started it, it took a lot of work, but the work seemed um, seamless. Like it was like I had to learn how to use audacity. That's the first thing I um, used to edit my podcast episodes. Mm -hmm. First, I had to learn audacity. And I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, I'll learn it. And I learned it in a couple hours. And then I had to put my website back up again. And I was like, okay, yeah, I'll learn it. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll just do it. And over the weekend, I built my entire website. And then from there, it's like everything that I needed to do one after the other, it just kind of happened. I didn't like audacity anymore because it didn't do the sound quite right. Mm -hmm. So I tried Adobe and I was like, oh man, this is a whole whole new software to learn. And I just started poking around two hours later, here I am in Adobe Audition, like just editing. And I don't see myself as a particularly technical person either, but I just got it. Mm -hmm. And because everything's happening so with hard work, but also seamlessly in that sense of it just kind of happens yeah. I'm sitting here. I'm like, man, the lesson is really true. One of my favorite quotes is whether you think you can or you can't, you are right. The power of our mindset, whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. I and love that. yeah, I wish I thought that I could earlier. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I think the reason I asked that question is because I feel like you know, we all kind of have those situations at different points in our lives. And I think that there's a part of it that's like knowing that we come to things as we're meant to and things kind of unfold as they're meant to for us in our journey. But also for people listening, like if you have something that's been calling to you, like just do it now. <laughs> like you're never totally. really gonna feel ready to like start a podcast or to teach your first yoga class or run your first retreat or do your first workshop or get that next certification. But you just have to like take a leap of faith and know that it'll work out. Yeah. Another quote that I, I have for that, because I'm such, again, I'm such a piglet. I'll like go out and measure how many steps it's going to take like 30 times, right? <laughs> but what I've really learned along this whole journey of entrepreneurship is also this quote of clarity comes with trying. You can only plan it out so much. Clarity comes with trying. So you just got to do. Yeah, I love that. I feel like that resonates a lot for me because I'm... I, maybe not like measuring the steps type thing. I think I'm a little bit like maybe clumsier than that, but I'm for sure... I'll like think about it for a little bit and I'll think about it a little bit more and then I'll dabble a little bit and then I'll doubt myself and then I'll think about it some more and then I'm like, okay, I'm going to do it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's totally a dance. And you know what? I love that you know what your rhythm is. And I have, I totally have something to say about understanding our own rhythms because for the longest time I felt, oh man, that lizard brain, I'm telling you, that lizard brain's really a downer. But <laughs> for the longest time, I, I had always felt like, oh man, I wish I was like, you know, that person who would beeline for something. I wish I were, were that pit bull versus this little piglet. Or I wish I was more of a tigger, right? Because tigger's always out and about and he'll just do whatever he feels mm-hmm. like. And I'm like, oh, I wish that's how I do it. But again, in listening to other people's stories and really contemplating this, 
not one is better than the other because Tigger probably spends his life hearing from other people about how he doesn't think about things, how he moves too fast, how he needs to like slow it all down. Yeah. How he's reckless and (laughs) yes, reckless. And he's always ruining things. Like he probably heard that his whole life and where it's really important is for us to understand like, what is your rhythm and then work with it. I know I need to trick myself. (laughs) I know I can't just say, go do that. I almost have to say, okay, well, why don't you just take one step forward and just see how that feels? And maybe I'll take the next. And knowing me, like I will take the next and I will take the next. And then soon enough, I'll be running. But first, I need to dip a big toe in. Yeah, yeah, for sure. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) I also love the, uh, the Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, I don't, I don't know where that came from. I love it Winnie works. the Pooh. So yeah, it works for me for sure. And yeah. so at, at what point did you decide that you wanted to become a desire map facilitator? Like what inspired that, that kind of shift in your business? Oh my gosh. I think that's where the miracle happened. I think that's where the miracle happened. So I knew about the desire map and the desire map for listeners who don't know what it is. It's a best-selling book, The Desire Map by the author Danielle Laporte. And that book, if I were to condense the whole concept of it into one quote, it is this. It is that everything that we do, every goal that we have, accomplishment that we want to make, we only have those because we think we want to feel a certain way when we get there, or we think we're going to feel a certain way when we get there. So let that absorb. Everything that you do in life, everything that you do in life is because you think you're going to feel a certain way when you get there. So if that's the case, we're doing it backwards. When we try to aim for these things, I'm just going to use a super typical example, which is like the corner office, right? Mm -hmm. We aim for this thing, which is a corner office, in hopes that we'll feel proud and accomplished and totally loved. Loved because people are like, wow, you made it to the corner office, right? And how many times do we hear the story of the person who's worked their butt off to get to that corner office and it's kind of disappointing where they're like, oh, I thought it would feel better than this. Mm-hmm. And it's probably happened in our lives too by, by this time, yeah, that there's something that you wanted that you thought would totally, utterly complete you as a human being. And if you didn't have it, you would never be complete. And then you get that thing, whether it be an eyeshadow or a position somewhere or a car or a house or whatever it is. And it's like, oh, I thought it would feel better. So that's the whole concept of the desire map. And it had come into my life years before I even knew you could become a desire map facilitator. It's actually the thing that gave me clarity in starting my podcast, gave me clarity in quitting my job. and. At that six month mark, right when I was about having that conversation with my friend, being like, oh my gosh, I thought I knew where the target was. I didn't know what the target was. Um, And now I don't know where the target is. I'm confused. I don't know what to do. (laughs) As if it magically was dropped in my lap came this opportunity. I was signing up for this business school because I was like, okay, maybe I just need to get my business-ness like up to par. So I was signing up for this business program. And as part of that business program, they had an affiliate who was Danielle Laporte. And as part of that affiliate program, it was a desire map facilitator license. And I didn't even know you could be a, become a desire map facilitator. All I knew was that there was this book that came into my life that helped me make these big decisions. And I'm totally sharing this book around with all my coworkers when I was working. And then six months after leaving my job, do you want to become a desire map facilitator? I was like, holy moly. And I was like, hell yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Totally took that opportunity. And it's just been such a gift since. Yeah. I mean, it's such a a beautiful way of thinking about how to live life, I think in general and how to run a business for sure. I'm curious, like how has your own business shifted 
based on like thinking about your business from being more heart centered, thinking about your core desired feelings? And then also how have you seen people that you've worked with their businesses shift? Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking. What a great question. So with the desire map, yes. So you figure out that your feelings is what runs the show. Like how you want to feel is what runs the show. Because when you say, I want to feel good and I want to be happy, that's something universally that we all want, right? We can all agree that at the end of the day, you want to feel good. At the end of the day, you want to be happy. And that's wonderful. But it's also kind of amorphous. Like what does happy even mean? And that's where these core desired feelings that you were mentioning comes into play. It's our inner compass. Different things, different feelings are going to make each of us feel, or there's a different combination of feelings that make each of us feel happy. And I like to give the contrasting example of, you know, for someone it might be tranquility and peace and quietude that they absolutely need in order to feel happy. And maybe for someone else, it's exhilaration and love, let's say, and freedom. And that's what makes them feel happy. If the if that's the case, each person's going to choose something really different in terms of how they live their lives to be happy. Mm-hmm. So my core desired feelings happens to be open heart love, wild and magnificent, gratefully opulent, at ease with flow, and um, connected. So all of those core desired feelings are highly heart-centered to begin with. And every day or every decision that I make for my business, I tap into these five feelings from what I decide that I'm going to work on each day. Does it make me feel most of these feelings or not? Like to be like, to be brutally honest, sometimes I don't feel like editing my podcasts. <laughs> it's <kind laughs> <Feel> of- that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Oh my gosh. But that's actually a truth. Like sometimes I don't, and it just feels so grueling to do it. Mm-hmm. So when I tap in on that day, okay, I'm going to edit my podcast, but do I feel open hearted about it? Do I feel connected when I do it? Do I, am I feeling the rest of my core desired feelings, or at least most of it. And if it's a no for any of them, or if it's a no, as in, I don't feel any of my core desired feelings, then I just leave it. I know that's so scary. I I still have heart palpitations, even though I'm sharing this. It's scary to work this way. I'm so used to working with, okay, well, you do what you need to do. But there's some magic that happens when you're tapped into these feelings because when I'm editing my podcast and it does match up to more of my core desired feelings than not, (laughs) it's really interesting how it happens, but I will listen back to that podcast, edit it. And inevitably there will be a nugget in there that I needed to hear Mm -hmm. or inevitably there will be a nugget in there that I needed to share with someone. And so I let the universe do its thing, a little bit of synchronicity in doing that. And then even for decisions, like even if I should do um, an interview with you, Amanda, like, do Mm -hmm. I come onto this podcast or not? Well, hell yeah, because Amanda makes me feel open hearted love and she's all about connection. And that makes me feel connected and wild and magnificent because (laughs) we have these big plans for each of our businesses. And I love hearing about yours. And I'm so honored that you want to hear about mine too. So yeah, absolutely. That's how I use it to drive my business. And as for some of my students who have gone through the desire map, well, I have to say, I don't know that it's changed their business, but I do know that it has changed the face of their lives. Mm -hmm. Because in our culture, in our society, we are so inundated with action and that kind of masculine energy, that it is a new concept to just about every, most people, not everybody, it's, it is a new concept to just about most people to lead with your feelings rather than your tasks. And yeah. that in itself, having that dropped into your awareness changes the face of how you operate. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, just for me personally, I feel like it's like, 
there's strong, I think, gut reactions or maybe like intuitive sort of things about whether or not something's right. But I feel like that little lizard brain can get in and rationalize things like, oh, I should say yes to this because it might end up being a great opportunity or maybe saying yes to paid opportunities because like, oh, I shouldn't be saying no to money. But I think that having your core desired feelings allows you to kind of get in touch with those decision-making abilities without it feeling so like, I don't know, is this my intuition or is this my lizard brain? Because sometimes it can be really confusing, like what's what and what is telling you what? Because then you're like, well, is my intuition saying no because I'm feeling lazy today or because I'm tired right now? Like, what is me tomorrow going to think about this? And there's, you can just drive yourself crazy trying to have those different conversations. And I feel like yeah. being like, is this in line with actually what I fundamentally believe in can be so powerful. Mm hmm. Totally, totally. And do I have a story about that? <laughs> <laughs> Just in. So when I was thinking about taking the leap and leaving my job, when I finally decided, because at first I decided it was going to be, I don't remember. I was like, oh, okay, it'll be in 2017. Like that. No, it was going to be the end of 2016. That's what it was. I was like, okay, it's going to be the end of 2016, totally decided that that's exactly what's going to happen. And lo and behold, it was during Christmas week where usually nobody is even in the office that I get approached by a manager who tells me about this position, this promotion that I, you know, I might want to look into that might be good for me. And I was like, oh crap. <laughs> but I was going to call it quits, right? I thought I had this under wraps. And, and so that promotion was proposed to me, even as an opportunity. And when we're faced with big decisions, you're so right, that lizard brain comes in, logic starts kicking in like at, in high gear, and we can barely listen to ourselves, this gut and heart brain that we have, this intuition that we have. And so good thing for me, I had my core desired feelings. And like as if it was a blueprint, a tangible blueprint of my inner compass, I literally used it as a map to plan out my decisions. Like option A, stay in my um, stay in my the current position, option B, take a promotion, option C, go and become a yoga teacher, like take the leap. And based on my core desired feelings, everything pointed to taking the leap. And I wish I could say like, and then that's totally what I did, but I, I guess I had another lesson to learn in terms of really trusting your intuition, even though it was so tangible because I did take that promotion and <laughs> things unraveled really quickly one one way or another, I was led to really see how that was not in alignment with what my right path was. And that's why when I left, I, I left with that new manager. And that's why I was so scared because I was like, I don't want to let her down. I just started. But at the same time, I know I have to leave. Now I know. Now I know. Now that I've taken the detour. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And yeah. sometimes you got to go the wrong direction to know that it's the wrong direction for sure. Yeah, exactly. That's amazing though. I love that. Um, I'm curious, we've touched on this a lot already, but are there any kind of big business lessons that you've learned through your yoga career that we haven't talked about that you want to share with listeners today? Mm -hmm. I do. It's just one big one. It is the one that you need to own into. It is the one that you need to spend the most of your time into. And I'm saying this so passionately and with such certainty because that truly has been my path so far. And I also see that that is what I'm about to share with you is the thing that creates success, however you define it or not. And that is that the biggest lesson that I've had in business so far is the lesson of mindset. No matter what the logical and tactical steps are for like running your business, like what social media platform should you be on? How often should you be bringing, putting out your email newsletters? What kinds of calls to action should you tell people? Who's your avatar? Who's your, you know, who's your ideal customer? All that stuff. Beyond all that stuff, you need to maintain your energy. You need to maintain your mindset and your state. 
Because going back to my quote of whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. There's no doubt that we can all write a newsletter. I think we all can. Absolutely. But whether you send that newsletter consistently or whether you send that newsletter out at all, all depends on your mindset. If you're sitting here thinking, oh no, I can't do it. I think I'm failing this. Um, This isn't working. And you will ride that roller coaster. (laughs) And that's just part of the entrepreneurial journey. There is that roller coaster. But the key is being able to be at the top of the roller coaster more often than you are at the bottom of the roller coaster. The top being having a sense of certainty, having a sense of I want to say like positive outlook, not to, not to force it though. Like you don't want to bypass any true fears that you have, but to choose, how about this? To choose to believe that you will make it more often than you choose to believe that you will not. And that's a daily thing that happens every single day, getting back into that energetic state every day, getting back into that mindset of, yeah, I can do it. I'm meant to do this. This is my path. It is feeling right. I love that. Yeah, that's such an important one and such a good one. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. That's, that's been a big one for me for sure, especially on the days where I'm like, what on earth have I done? <laughs> yeah, and then you need to surround yourself with friends who will like bring you back up to that roller coaster some days yeah. too because man, I've been there too. Like, oh no, I think it, like, you know, nothing's working. Or one of my thoughts, I'm like, what's one of my recurring thoughts when I'm at the bottom? Yeah, it, it is nothing's working. What am I even doing? And then you have friends who will bring you back up and you're like, oh yeah, that's what I'm doing. This is my purpose. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I can definitely relate to that as well. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Final question for you is, do you have a top tip for new yoga teachers who are starting out in their careers? I do. It's really simple, but just do it. Just get started. Find that one class. I think sometimes it's overwhelming when we're like, oh, and then like I want to have 19 classes and then all this stuff. And then you kind of overwhelm yourself. But if you just give yourself that one completely doable goal of just do that one class, one class, whether it be you bringing friends together for a charity event or whether it be you even subbing for a yoga class, just get that one class and the momentum will start for you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's such a good one. I think it's, yeah, just starting is like one of the biggest things because there's so many reasons not to start. Yeah, <laughs> if I know. you allow those reasons to kind of overwhelm you, you just literally will not start. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. I could talk to you all day about this stuff, but I want to be mindful of your time. So thank you so much for this conversation today. Uh, If people want to learn more about you, maybe even work with you for Desire Map stuff, listen to your podcast, where can they go to find you? Yeah, for sure. So my podcast is the Curious Monkey, M-O-N-K-I podcast. And my Instagram handle and Facebook page also happens to be at Curious Monkey, M-O-N-K-I. You can check out my website at veronicatide.com or I'm so happy to hear from you. If you have any further questions or you want to find out more, you can always email me at veronica at curiousmonkey.com. Amazing. Thank you so much for chatting with me today. This has been such a conver- it's such a fun conversation and I'm just so glad that we connected in life in general, that we're both from Alberta, that we have the chance to hopefully meet up in person and that you've given me this time to, to tell your story. So thank you. Yes, exactly. It's been a pleasure being on. Thank you so much, Amanda. All right, guys, I hope that you enjoyed that episode of the podcast with Veronica Tai. Make sure you go and check out everything that she's up to on her website, veronicatai.com. Check out her podcast, Curious Monkey, and the Desire Map sessions. I really cannot speak about those highly enough. It was a big game changer in my own business, and I really, really, really recommend her services. As always, you can find information on the show notes at mbomyoga.com. You can find me on Facebook and Instagram at Mastering the Business of yoga and you can join the private facebook community at yoga business badasses as always if you have any questions comments or feedback you can send me an email at info at mbomyoga.com otherwise i'll see you next week namaste